This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. The climate crisis already factors into where people choose and are forced to live, and it's projected to get worse. By 2070, that 1% of the planet that has historically been inhospitable expands to 20% of the planet's surface. According to the UN, most climate displacement will be within borders. In the U.S., we don't really have a system that is set up to handle that. We just don't have a deep knowledge about the rights of internally displaced persons in this country. We never really thought about what it is to have people displaced within our own borders. On a global scale, where will climate displacement be most disruptive? Every single region of the world will be affected by climate displacement in some way. I think those regions that are particularly prone to sort of natural hazards, they will be much more impacted by sort of climate shocks. On the run, voluntary and forced climate migration. Up next on Climate One. The climate crisis may not be the sole driver of human displacement, but it is a contributing and growing factor, exacerbating the misery of already struggling communities. According to the UN Refugee Agency, climate change typically creates internal displacement within countries before it pushes people across national borders. While much of this displacement is involuntary, many with wealth and foresight are able to move before things get really bad. How well are governments prepared to handle an influx of people driven from their homes and support those who are left behind? Abram Lusgarten, senior reporter at ProPublica, has reported on climate migration and the models helping to predict what that human flow will look like in the future. Lusgarten wrote that by 2070, more than 3 billion people may find themselves living outside the optimum climate for human life. That number blows my mind. I asked him to explain. It's an extraordinary number, and it and it's far greater than you know what many scientists talk about when they talk about migration, but it's based off of a study that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, which uh, looked back over 6,000 years and found that you know humans lived in a relatively small niche in terms of the environmental conditions, the temperature and the amount of precipitation that exists in the places where they live. And that as those patterns have shifted, human populations have shifted with those patterns. But the places that were inhospitable on the planet in the past were relatively small. They cover about 1% of the planet's surface. And when you look and model out uh, climate change into the next couple of decades, by 2070, that 1% of the planet that has historically been inhospitable expands to 20% of, of the planet's surface, the planet's area. And when you look at how many people presently live in that 20% area, it's about a third of the planet's population, uh, which is you know about 2.2 2.5 billion people now, but by 2070 will be 3 billion people. And so that doesn't mean, of course, that you know that 3 billion people will move in some mass wave of migration, but it means that 3 billion people will find themselves you know, coping with the discomforts of how their environment has changed to various, it'll be more extreme in some places and less extreme in others, but it will be a negative change for one in three people on the face of the planet. And some portion of those people will be making decisions about how they respond to it, either being displaced or choosing to move. Often we think about climate migration, we think about forced migration, but that's not the entire picture. How does voluntary migration compare to forced migration? So this is just a really clear distinction. And, you know, in my work and in the academic work, you know, it's described as sort of slow onset change versus fast disruptive change. And, you know, it's kind of obvious uh, to think about what happens when a major hurricane destroys a city like New Orleans and those people look for, you know, a place to go in response. But the other end of the spectrum is, you know, is my experience with wildfire in Northern California. It's that almost imperceptible shift uh, that sort of chips away over time and, increases the burden of a decision that may or may not lead to my moving. And, you know, that's um, that kind of migration uh, worldwide is directly related to uh, the means that individuals have. So, you know, there's a wealth component to um, basically the greater the wealth of of an individual, the more ability that they have to to be mobile, to uh, to move their family or to move to another country uh, or to choose a different place to live. And so it means that we'll see a shift first in populations in pressured areas of the people who have the greatest ability to, uh, you know, seek a new economic opportunity or something like that elsewhere. 
You have written about a great transformation underway in the eastern half of Russia and how Russia aims to win the climate crisis by refashioning itself as a powerhouse food producer. The title of your article in the New York Times Magazine was, yeah, how Russia wins the climate crisis. So how has the invasion of Ukraine impacted that calculus? It's proven the global dependency on, uh, you know, on Russian and Ukrainian exports of, of grain. Russia is already, you know, the world's largest producer and exporter of of wheat is just an essential uh, supplier of food to the rest of the world. And that gives it an extraordinary amount of geopolitical leverage uh, over the countries that depend on those imports uh, in North Africa and the Middle East um, and elsewhere. And Ukraine is an example of how the sort of willful disruption of that pipeline of food supplies can be destabilizing and can also bend, you know, other countries, other sovereign nations to the will of, um, you know, of a country like Russia. The climate component, you know, which doesn't directly relate to Ukraine, but uh, but it is an opportunity potentially for Russia is the potential opening of, of more land to farming. And that's already happening in the Russian Far East, which is part of what I looked at, you know, through my reporting. So lands, you know, that were frozen not too long ago, that were tundra uh, and, and uh, solid with permafrost are already thawed. And as they're thawing are being quickly developed by Russian farmers, by Chinese industrial agriculture firms for, you know, the growth of crops, for the growth of wheat, for um, the production of animals, for meat, uh, and so forth. And so whether or not Russia fully capitalizes on that or not, you know, kind of remains to be seen. But there's an opportunity there for uh, economic growth, Russia being an example of, you know, of any northern uh, country. And there's research, uh, including by a a researcher named Marshall Burke at Stanford University, you know, that has also examined the impact economically uh, to countries as, you know, as the climate warms. And most of his findings are that where, you know, in the middle and southern part of, of the globe or in the United States southward, that, you know, climate will have, climate change will have a, a negative economic effect. But the inverse of that is that north of the middle of the United States, uh, there's, he projects a positive economic uh, effect. So the, the, you know, the GDP per capita growth in Canada might increase by about 230%. And in Russia, it might increase by about 400%. And, uh, you know, per capita is a key phrase there. So these are countries with relatively small populations. And when you think about the opportunity for migration or the inevitability of migration of populations, there's a, there's a potential connection between the influx of people, uh, the influx of a labor force in those regions and their ability to seize on that. Yeah. There's fascinating research on productivity peaks at about 55 degrees average temperature, which no coincidence is the average temperature of Silicon Valley and some other very highly productive places. Well, some U.S. mayors and cities are preparing for an influx of residents due to accelerating climate disruption. Tell us what's happening in places such as Buffalo, Ann Arbor, and elsewhere. Yeah, you know, it's early days uh, in this conversation and for this process, but you are starting to see certain regions anticipating that they will be destinations for a shift in population as the climate warms. The mayor of Buffalo, New York, has talked several times about Buffalo being a climate destination city. Uh, it's not clear yet from a policy perspective of exactly what that means or how that will manifest, but it's a it's a really explicit acknowledgement that they expect people to move there. They expect the environment in Buffalo, which can be pretty harsh in the winters with its lake effect snow um, on Lake, lake Ontario, to, to be a more inviting place with bountiful fresh water uh, in a climate change future and that they plan to capitalize on on those changes. You know, there's similar expressions of uh, optimism and planning uh, in the sustainability plans for the state of Vermont, uh, as you mentioned, uh, Duluth, uh, Minnesota. And really, you know, a- around the Great Lakes, I'm um, hearing and seeing um, cities uh, and regional planners uh, start to think about what the population changes in response to climate might be, how they size infrastructure um, in the future, taking that change into account, you know, and what, you know, what a warmer future might mean uh, for those particular places. And how about Atlanta? How does Atlanta fit into the migration we expect uh, within the United States? Yeah. So what we see globally with climate and migration is uh, 
what's called stepwise migration. And it's basically that, you know, people who are displaced or are pushed into moving uh, as a result of environmental factors tend to want to move the shortest distance possible. Uh, They're not looking to, you know, be thousands of miles away from home and community uh, and the lands that are familiar to them. In the sou- southeastern United States will face, uh, you know, multiple pressures, including sea level rise and extreme heat and increasing, you know, prevalence of hurricanes. And the southwestern United States has some of those risks, plus um, extraordinary drought. And as, as people move out of those areas, Atlanta is one of the nexuses for um their their projected pathways. Uh, there's a researcher out of Florida State University named Matt Hauer, a, a demographer who has studied the displacement from uh, sea level rise on on U.S. coasts and used previous IRS and and census data tracking how Americans have moved to project where the Americans who are displaced from the coastlines might go. Uh, and you know, and his his figures are, you know, an estimation of about 14 million American migrants displaced by sea level rise alone. And his numbers are the are the ones that, you know, lead to that projection for, you know, nearly, you know, half a million to a million people moving into the Atlanta area. You said that by and large governments are not well prepared. It's early days, but hedge funds are. They're looking at these numbers you're talking about. Can you give an example of that? How markets are starting to recognize this? You know, like like any dramatic change, I mean, the opportunity to speculate on that change um, is just a, an enormous opportunity to amass wealth. So you're seeing hedge funds invest, for example, in water rights in the Western United States buying up uh, water that they can either hold or resell uh, or limit and as it, and profit from as its scarcity increases. You're seeing some of you know the same sort of speculative change in the real estate market. The largest real estate firms in the country are trying to carefully time their investments and or their exits from communities based on you know when their models or their best advice that they can get will project you know a change in demand for those areas. And often that change of demand is negative, which is a you know an interesting explicit recognition of you know of the migration phenomenon but it, you know they're they're timing when they expect that certain communities will collapse and when the demand for housing or for office space in those communities will collapse you've mentioned today how economic development and growth helps countries and communities prepare and be resilient to climate disruption and how the volatility that climate brings could bring wealth creation wealth transfer uh, some people can choose to move. Uh, there are communities who don't have the resources to respond to the climate crisis or be able to move. Can you tell us about these trapped communities? You know, mobility, uh, you know, is is commensurate with, you know, the ability to, you know, to move. And one half of the equation, especially, you know, in the United States, will be what, ha- you know, what happens to the communities that are left behind. So these will be communities that uh, either you know, are have higher rates of poverty or uh, older populations that are a little more resistant to making major life changes or choose to remain in difficult places because uh, their ties are so deep or their spiritual connection to their land or their, you know, their community history or family history. Um, there'll be a variety of reasons why people won't move. But what, you know, my reporting suggests is that in the places where the effects of climate change are dramatic, but uh, communities are most resistant to, you know, to change, uh, or where people are are trapped in those communities, there'll be a negative spiral effect. Essentially, you know, uh, some people will move. The tax base of certain communities will decline. It will degrade further the quality of the schools, which will lead to more people moving. Um, and what you'll arrive at at the end of that sort of degrading process is that the only people left are the people who have no ability to leave uh, at all, and that will present a different sort of burden and obligation for policymakers to address, which is just as important as, you know, preparing for and building infrastructure to meet expanding populations in destination cities will be, you know, devising new ways to support the, you know, the changing um, systems and communities for, you know, for the people left behind, either, you know, by propping up their school systems or ensuring that there's employment or or offering other sorts of, of social support. Yeah, I'm thinking brings images of the people left behind uh, in New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina came in because there were no buses and they they couldn't didn't own cars they couldn't get Absolutely. out. Absolutely, um, Abram Lustgarten, thanks for sharing your insights on climate migration, fast and slow, forced and voluntary. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Greg. 
You're listening to a Climate One conversation about climate migration and displacement. Coming up, how do we help the most climate vulnerable communities? We live in a country where the systems and everything that we've had in place for all of this time have created a vulnerability by targeting particular populations. And if that were an accepted truth, then our new stance and our new priority should be on repairing the harm that has led to the vulnerability. That's up next when Climate One continues. The U.S. has a mixed track record for handling the aftermath of natural disasters. The response has been especially lacking for poor and communities of color. As the climate crisis brings more extreme weather, how will the U.S. respond? And how can we break the cycle of inequity where the poorest are hit first and worst? Colette Pichon Battle is president of Taproot Earth, an organization that describes itself as a nonprofit, public interest law firm, and justice center with a mission to advance structural shifts toward climate justice and ecological equity. I asked her how her personal experience in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina affected her understanding of migration. In the beginning, right after Katrina, what what you knew, what you heard, and what you saw was um, a number of people from the Gulf South being um, moved out of a really bad situation. So they had stayed, for example, during the storm, and um, the federal government and others were just getting people out of out of the zone, um, the disaster zone. This looked like a lot of one way tickets um, on either airplanes or buses or trains. Um, and uh, in I was in D.C. at the time, and I was helping um, to shelter folks or orient folks who were landing in D.C. and found out that some of them didn't even understand where they were going. Um, they knew they were getting out of New Orleans. They knew they were getting out of Louisiana, but they didn't know exactly where they were going. Many of them had never left um, the Gulf ever. Um, Prior to Katrina, Louisiana had the highest population of people who had never left the state. Um, And so we're dealing with people who had never left outside of Louisiana before. They never, they didn't know the difference between Dallas and Dulles. And many of them thought they were going to Dallas and found themselves at Dulles Airport in um, Northern Virginia. Um, And it was really scary to watch how inhumane um, or impersonable that experience was for folks in the midst of trauma. I think I also, when I went back home, I saw how many immigrants were being brought into the country through legal immigration processes, although they were being labeled as illegal and unlawful. The truth is that they were coming in on business and agricultural worker visas through these big companies that were... um, often seen only in the uh, aftermath of war. Um, so um, you, you think about like Halliburton, um, there was a big group here, the Shaw Group. These big companies, Fortune 500 companies, are used in disaster uh, cleanup. Um, they, they clear roads, they, they put the bridges back together, you know, they do all of that, but they actually use a lot of immigrant labor and I had no idea about that. And to see the numbers of immigrants that were being brought in specifically from South America and Central America, but then also watching the numbers of particularly poor Black folks that were being pushed out of the region, it made no sense, right? There was a whole new wave of people coming in while there was one wave of people being pushed out. Um, As an African-American, that was disconcerting to say the least to to watch that process. And as an immigration attorney, um, my job was to try to help uh, the folks who needed support with their immigration status. Yeah, it it was interesting to see how those systems were maneuvered, right? So the Seasonal worker visas was how they brought a lot of folks in. But on those worker visas, when you lose your job, you lose your status. That's very different from the uh, highly educated worker visas, where if you lose your job, you have months to find another job, right? And what that looks like. And so watching folks ask for their paycheck, be fired, and then lose their status and their paycheck was was not um, a one-off. It was a system. And I realized that this is a system that is employed over and over again, right? So our immigration laws really benefit uh, large corporations, but they don't don't benefit the worker. 
Uh, and so just thinking about that, um, thinking about the opportunities of all of these Black men who were out of work um, when they were thousands of jobs that were being given uh, to immigrant workers at half the price, right? Half the half the normal wage, um, I would say. So watching like, you know, $14 an hour jobs go down to 8 and $6 an hour and then not even be paid out. So it's really changed my understanding of what it means to have a network in place, right? A family network in place, uh, what it means um, for our immigration laws, what it means for um, employment impacts, especially on uh, Black men. Um, this all really came uh, rushing in all at one time uh, during this process. And Katrina was a big national wake up moment for many people, the first real extreme climate driven uh, disaster. Uh, have we made any progress or learned anything since Katrina and this system or is the same system in place, say, for example, when Hurricane Ida hits Louisiana and goes all the way up to New Jersey? Yeah, when we talk about migration, the same system is in place, um, which is um, insufficient. Uh, first of all, we just don't have a deep knowledge about the rights of internally displaced persons in this country. This is an international law, an international standard, but it, it applies globally. Um, but because the U.S. had never really seen this kind of disaster before, we never really thought about what it is to have people displaced within our own borders. Those are internally displaced persons, different from refugees, which is a word I like to um, correct people on and even reject when we're talking about climate uh, migration inside of the U.S. border. So an example is in South Louisiana, we've got folks moving, um, getting out of harm's way in, the, in an acute disaster, but also the slow moving uh, migration that we see happening due to sea level rise. All of this is happening within U.S. borders um, and the rights of internally displaced people apply here. Um, we have not made strides as a nation um, to affirm or to advance a lot of these international laws and, and treaties that are in place. In fact, we are often the the, the lone non-signatory or uh, one us and a few other countries not signing on to uh, to treaties and rights uh, that we want to recognize. We've been talking about people uh, displaced and who involuntarily moved uh, from their homes or forced from climate impacts, fast or slow. Uh, let's talk about people who are moving voluntarily. Uh, there's certainly a shift underway where people who are looking at the climate and, and moving before uh, their town burns or their water runs dry. These are obviously people with wealth and privilege. What are your thoughts about that migration? Yeah, I mean, I think that last sentence <laughs> hit it all. These are obviously people with wealth and privilege, right? And wealth and privilege isn't just money and whiteness. It's often access to information. It's often analysis. I was just talking to this climate leader, um, older white man who just, you know, made a comment about, you know, him and his family moving to Canada. And I was like, mm, smart move. Uh, someone who's been tracking this for a long time, Um what we're seeing, especially in South Louisiana and throughout the Gulf South, are um, upper middle class white families moving to a place where they can be safe. Um, so folks from South Louisiana moving to places like Tennessee or even um, Kentucky um, or, or these other spaces, um, keeping their homes in in Louisiana or trying to sell them um, while the markets are still showing that this is a decent investment, but also selling them knowing that whoever purchases them, who purchase, whoever purchases these homes, they will be stuck with a 30-year mortgage um, that once it's over um, will have uh, real estate completely devalued, certainly uh, lower if not at full zero where I live. Uh, which is a coastal parish uh, where we're not going to see any value be able to be given to these homes because the roads and the bridges and all of these things aren't going to be upkept. We're seeing uh, those types of uh, divestment from our state government right now and, and really forcing uh, relocation of, of, of folks uh, down in the lower parishes. But to get back to the folks who can move, I think they're looking at the writing on the wall. I mean, it's interesting being in this red zone, right, the the, the South, uh, where in places like Florida and Texas and even Louisiana for a long time, you couldn't say climate change. Uh, but mostly you couldn't say that because they didn't want markets and people to react to it. I think people are looking at the writing on the wall and deciding that their future 
is better off not in this hurricane alley, not in this uh, heat zone and, and able to make the choice, but have the wealth and access and information to do so. Well, in 2020, 90,000 people moved to Arizona, which is already facing severe drought problems. Lake Mead is like scary dry, like running out this summer. You know, this is an example of a trend of people moving into climate risk areas where there's been fires and droughts, et cetera. What do you make of that kind of behavior? I think it's really interesting because I think, you know, it's one thing to be a, a climate advocate for the last 17 years and to watch people come into a knowledge and a reality around climate change. I mean, how long did that take? It took such a long time for people to just really kind of get it. I think what we weren't counting on is the political instability and the political fervor and marketing that is happening at the same time, right? So I think when we look at places like Arizona, even Texas is seeing um, some big moves into it. Uh, Florida is seeing moves into it. Like, Why would anybody be moving to Texas or Florida at this point? I'm not certain, um, except for the politics. Um, now there are some political reasons um, to start moving to those places. There's actually, um, you know, um, invitations for people to come in and and build your business here and move your family here um, sure. because of the politics and the laws and the and the you know uh, benefits as it's being proposed to folks and I think it's being done without any analysis around climate I think it's an interesting mixture of people not being able to discern what's actually happening globally not believing that the United States is going to have any impacts from this very sort of uh, disjointed impact of climate that will happen to others and not us. Um, and I think it's part of a political reality where people are being um, invited into spaces to build stronger political roots. Yeah, I think there's also some cognitive bias. People think uh, bad things happen to other people or in the time frame I'm going to be there. I'll get out before the really bad stuff happens and it'll work for me for a little while. And, you know, according to a Newsy report, economists predict going forward that poor communities will end up getting paid to relocate because it's cheaper, while rich communities will likely see a lot of money pouring in to make their buildings more resilient. You know, is that happening? You've talked a little bit about what happens after disaster. But could this climate resilience kind of, you know, exacerbate the disproportionate allocation of resources? It's a it's a complicated question. Um, paid to relocate is, I think, the wrong way to understand what is likely to happen. I think uh, buyouts is what mm -hmm. folks are referring to. And buyouts really have to do with sort of percentage of the wealth of your asset. Right. So what happens when you don't have an asset? What happens when you don't own your home? Pay to move is not what I've seen. I've seen um, uh, declarations from the state that say we will no longer be repairing this road. Uh, we will no longer be sending first responders out past this point. We will no longer be um, providing uh, any kind of uh, assistance uh, in this way or that way. And so folks are being told uh, that you'll be on your own. Um, and you can make your decision from there. And then I think, you know, we're also looking at federal dollars that can help to create uh, new communities, which is what we're seeing with the first federal dollars uh, that came for sea level rise um, migration or, or relocation, rather, in Louisiana. Nobody was paid to move, but the communities that people were, were um, uh, being asked to help uh, co-develop and, and move to those were paid uh, by federal dollars. So there wasn't an exchange of money, uh, but there was um, this sort of uh, shifting of location. Um, I, I think in, in watching the uh, wealthy uh, communities and, and what's happening and what's going to likely happen, yeah, I think, you know, now we get to be green, right? Now you get to do everything the right way. Let's help those with um, fortify what they have. Um, and this is, I think, um, the way of the U.S., the way of the Western world, right? There is a group of people who have something that needs to be secured. Let us secure it. Um, the rest of the folks don't have anything that needs to be secured, so we won't secure it. <laughs> and then you watch the breakdown of that very flawed theory 
instead of thinking of things like, you know, these these disasters are going to come. Why don't we, one, not build in places that are going to flood, two, reinforce the places where the most vulnerable populations live first, and three, ask the folks who have wealth to take accountability and responsibility, not for any wrong action, but for a new global reality that includes the U.S. and what we need to do. I think we have not figured out how to distribute dollars in a fair way in this country. I've watched it over and over and over again in every single disaster from Katrina to BP and all of the ones beyond, because I think we don't have a prioritization of the right people. Um, And we don't even talk about uh, the vulnerable populations the right way. We say, you know, these folks are vulnerable. They're most at risk. They're marginalized. But the truth is that we live in a country where the systems and everything that we've had in place for all of this time have created a vulnerability by targeting particular populations. And if that were an accepted truth, then our new stance and our new priority should be on repairing the harm that has led to the vulnerability and led to this climate vulnerability as a way of accountability, Right. So this isn't us giving out anything to people who don't work. (laughs) This is us acknowledging that we have targeted groups of people throughout this country for a very long time and created climate vulnerabilities that now need to be addressed as a priority. But I think this is a moment for us to take really big leaps. We could use this moment to repair past harms. What an opportunity. Now what we lack uh, and what we need to find is visionary leadership willing to show some courage around shifting our thoughts and our priorities. We're increasingly seeing the environment and climate used as excuses by some on the right to push anti-immigrant ideas and even carry out violent acts like mass shootings. How big a threat is eco-fascism fueled in part by fears of caravans and mass migration into the United States? What a question. I mean, hate is a product of fear. And fear is what our entire cognizant country is is going through for one reason or another. And I think the climate crisis, I think it scares people. It scares me. It should scare all of us. This one's a big one. And this one's bigger than any sort of one system's failure, right? This is everything. And this is all of us. And so because I think we don't have good social practices around fear, because I think we've never really addressed racism in a way that gets to the the, the heart of the thing um, and, and, and really takes us to a, a much more reparative place, I think we're going to see it play out. I think we're seeing it play out. I think this is what people meant in the aftermath of Katrina when we said the word disaster. It was not just the storm. It was the storm on top of history, on top of broken systems, on top of divestment from this region, on top of all of that, uh, that led to a disaster. And, and what we're seeing now is the creation of a slow moving disaster rooted in racism and white supremacy and oppression. And really, I think, labeled as um, protecting our country or keeping people out. I think what we're not seeing in the analysis is how U.S. national and global policies are accelerating migration from the very places that we're seeing caravans. You know, how are our free trade agreements actually creating uh, situations and realities that people have to migrate away from, be it economically or now even based on climate? None of that is part of the analysis. It's just the brown people coming uh, that that we seem to fear and and allow uh, to occur. Um, I, as I worked in immigration law for so many years, you know, I watched people talk about immigrants and never really meant Western European immigrants or even Eastern European immigrants. What they meant were brown people coming from the border, or black people uh, coming through our our airports. And it was it was code language um, to say, you know, those brown folks, those others are coming to take what we have. Uh, you know, if you're going to have that analysis there, y- you have to at least ask, why are they coming? What's driving them here? It's not I mean, <laughs> we can see from our murder rates and our 
uh, police brutality rates and our, you know, all of these other struggles we're having. People aren't coming here because this is like a really great, safe place for brown people to live, grow and thrive. That's not what's happening. They're moving to save their own lives. We've talked about fear driving uh, migration from the global south into the north. We've talked about fear of privileged white people in the United States. They're afraid of losing something. Uh, You acknowledged having fear about climate change. Uh, How do you hold that fear? Do you think about staying there in a place you know that's going to see climate impacts and, and suffering? Or do you also have those flight fantasies that I think everyone who has this conversation has at one time or another? Yeah, you know, fear is powerful. It is um, powerful and necessary, right? We don't just have this emotion for no reason. We have it because um, our, our survival and our lives depend on it. I think we're in a moment where we have to discern when our fear is being um, catalyzed and manipulated versus when it versus when it's being um, uh, catalyzed for for our survival. Um, and so, I have. Um, I have decided to stay in South Louisiana, but I can make that choice because I'm single. I don't have children. I don't have all of these things that many people have to worry about. And I know I can make a decision like that, that many families can't make. Um, but I intend to stay on the land that my people are from. Um, we've been on that land since before it was the United States. And if there's one Pichon left standing, it'll be, uh, it'll be me. And I hope we can figure something out before then, but you know, the odds are that my community is not going to make it. Um, and so I have to absorb that fear and think about what it is to witness. Um, what is my responsibility, um, in the, in the face of great loss, uh, not just loss of my physical property, but loss of the history that goes along with that. I think it requires me to conjure a big courage and I try to conjure that courage in others, Um, I do think, though, more than sea level rise, which is what is going to destroy my community um, physically, I think the heat is another consideration. Um, I stayed during Hurricane Ida last year and, um, you know, we were without power for over a week and the storm was one thing, but the heat was a whole other ballgame. And I'm getting older. You know, what does it look like to leave the region during... um, the hurricane seasons and then come back um, for the rest of the time. It used to be that that would, that could happen, right? I could be gone for four months or so, but um, hurricane season is widening. Um, These, these storm seasons are getting longer um, uh, officially um, by two months now. So I think fear is um, necessary. We can't lose it. We have to be able to discern when it's being manipulated and, in the midst of the worst kind of fear, we have to find deep courage. And I think um, that's the moment we're in. Um, I think about that with climate. I think about that with white supremacists. I think about that with even our the state of our political, um, our, our political state of affairs right now um, requires all of us to recognize the fear in our bodies and recognize what we're feeling is real and probably necessary. Um, but also um, to examine what it is to show great courage in moments of great fear. Colette Bichon Battle, thank you for sharing your courage and your fear and your insights on migration in the age of climate. Thank you so much. Ashe, thank you, Greg. You're listening to a conversation about migration in a world disrupted by burning fossil fuels. This is Climate One. Coming up, what does climate displacement look like on a global scale? We can enumerate the number of people that have been displaced in the past year uh, due to weather-related disasters. That number this past year was 30 million people. That's up next when Climate One continues. The United Nations says the number of forcibly displaced people globally recently surpassed 100 million. That's more than 1% of the world population. The top causes cited were the war in Ukraine, civil wars, violence, persecution, and human rights violations. Until recently, climate wasn't even tracked as a factor for global displacement. I asked Kaylee Ober, Senior Advocate and Program Manager for the Climate Displacement Program at Refugees International, 
what kind of data there is on global migration when it comes to climate. We actually have a really interesting data set that's that's collected by the Internal Displacement Monitoring Center every year, uh, where we can enumerate the number of people that have been displaced in the past year uh, due to um, weather-related disasters. That number this past year was 30 million people displaced by weather-related events. And actually, that follows a trend from the year before, which also uh, found that 30 million people were displaced due to weather-related events. So we can see sort of a a consistent trend line there. So about 30 million people on the move inside their country borders because of climate-related events. We hear about hotspots. What regions will be most affected by climate displacement? I think we can say that Every single region of the world will be affected by climate displacement in some way. Um, I think those regions that are particularly prone to sort of natural hazards, so they're prone to sort of hurricanes or cyclones, for instance, or let's say people that live there are more dependent on rainfall for their livelihoods, like their farmers, subsistence farmers, um, they will be much more impacted by sort of climate shocks than, than other regions. And so we're particularly interested in those regions that have those characteristics and also might have some underlying simmering tension or conflict. So you'll find that, for instance, in the Sahel or the Horn of Africa, for instance. Um, And you'll also find those those, uh, natural hazard prone areas like in South Asia, like Bangladesh, uh, poster child for sort of flooding and, and cyclones, for instance. Right. And what are the differences between quick onset and slow onset climate impacts? There's hurricanes and tornadoes that happen really quickly and dramatic and drive a lot of dramatic television footage. And then there's the really slow unfolding droughts and melts that are really a whole different tempo. What, which ones cause their people to flee their homes? That's a really interesting question, Um, mostly because we have really good data or, like you said, the media tends to cover sudden onset events really well, right? We can see the displacement happening real time. Uh, It's very tangible um, and easy to see. And um, so when we look at sort of the, for instance, the numbers we talked about, 30 million people displaced internally due to weather-related events, that's largely sudden onset events. Um, It's, you know, you're evacuating in the face of a cyclone, you're sheltering, you're really quickly away from that storm. Um, You seek higher ground because of that flood. And so we can really track that displacement. When it comes to slow onset events that unfold over a long period of time, you know, we're talking desertification, we're talking sea level rise. A minute change may happen every year, and maybe it's not as obvious to those um, experiencing it on the ground, and it slowly creeps in and erodes livelihoods, for instance. And so it may induce people to move, but it's harder to really pinpoint when that tipping point is. And so that's why we don't have great data about it, because it's uh, very layered and complex uh, because of the way it unfolds, Um, and also because it's just not as dramatic looking like it is with sudden onset events. When things happen quickly, it's visible and and it's clear why people move. Elsewhere in this episode, we talk about voluntary uh, movement and involuntary movement. Um, Do poor people leave first or are they the last to leave? Because it can take money to move. And yet often, you know, it might be desperate people who are forced to move. Yeah, I think in particular with climate related events, there's a huge gray area between sort of voluntary and involuntary movement. Um, There are many sort of qualitative uh, case studies that show that in the face of sort of these uh, weather related shocks, these climate related shocks, uh, the poor tend to move first because they have to. Um, Right. So the livelihoods that they usually depend upon uh, such as farming, right, are often irrevocably damaged. Um, and so in order to sort of overcome that shock, they'll usually migrate somewhere where there's an employment opportunity that's not necessarily linked to weather. So often it's rural to urban migration when you go to cities to find sort of informal jobs there. We also find, though, that the poorest of the poor don't don't have the capital necessary to move. They don't have the economic capital to mobilize. They don't have the social capital, the, uh, friends or family in the cities that can welcome them mm-hmm. or tell them where jobs are. And so often mm-hmm. they are what we're, we call trapped in places uh, that are impacted by, by these events. 
And there's talk about building resilience in cities in order to absorb climate migrants. Of course, over the course of human history, there's been rural to urban migration. That is kind of one of the through lines of human civilization. So what can cities do? What do cities need to do to be able to prepare to absorb climate refugees and climate migrants? Well, first, I think cities have to acknowledge that there will be more and more people moving to them, especially in the face of climate change. Um, just for the very reasons we outlined before, right? So as it becomes harder and harder to earn a living um, in rural places, especially with things that are related to the weather, like agriculture, the more um, people will move to cities. And we see that trend probably intensifying in a number of different sort of projections out there, right? Um, so one, it's first acknowledging it. And two, it's also preparing for it. So um, I often really re I reference this one project that is quite interesting in Bangladesh. They're trying to identify secondary cities in which they, they um, are able to make them more climate resilient and migrant friendly. So ensuring that the infrastructure in those cities are actually resistant to different sort of climactic changes, uh, ensuring that migrants are welcomed and integrated, that they have access to stable, formal jobs that have good contracts, right, are well paying, um, that they have access to social protection, right, so they can send their kids to school, they can access health care. It's basically um, cities need to offer sort of a stabilizing force uh, in the face of climate change and, and be prepared in that way. I've done um, in the past when I've talked to people about climate migration, they, it, people will often say that people, um, refugees don't identify themselves as climate migrants. They may not even, depending on their income level and education level, may not even really understand climate change. They just know that their crops failed or something happened that, that compelled them to move. And until recently, there really was no legally recognized definition of climate refugee. And in 2020, the UN High Commission on Refugees issued legal considerations to guide the interpretation and steer international discussions about climate refugees. What did you think when that happened? And what is the significance of that UNHCR uh, consideration? Yeah, those UNHCR legal considerations um, were hugely important in a number of ways. First, it was the first time that UNHCR really went out of their way to include climate change in any sort of assessment, um, really be really grapple with it um, in a full-throated way. Um, and basically what those local considerations say is that, um, yes, the 1951 Refugee Convention is quite narrow in nature. Um, to become or to be to qualify as a refugee, you must still uh, qualify um, under that definition, right? So you must be crossing a border, you must be uh, persecuted based on a number of, of um, characteristics like uh, race, religion, social group, et cetera. But what you must also do if you are assessing or adjudicating a, a refugee claim or asylum claim is also assess um, what role uh, climate change might play in the context of that persecution, right? So, for instance, if there has been some sort of climate-related event like a cyclone and your house has been destroyed, your crops have been destroyed, you know, you're stranded, you're having issues recovering or being resilient, um, and your government, because you happen to be of a particular social group, purposely withholds aid from you, um, then you might have a claim to persecution, right? Right. Um, what the legal considerations paper also does is say, like, look, there are other sorts of refugee definitions in different regions, like in Latin America, there's a Cartagena Declaration, um, and, and Af in Af Africa, there's the uh, OAU Convention, which really has a more expansive interpretation of refugee, including in cases of public disorder. Um, so the argument is climate change or climate-related events uh, would qualify in cases uh, of public disorder, right? So it's just trying to slowly nudge that refugee definition to be more, um, more broad or more all-encompassing. According to the World Bank's Groundswell report, the climate crisis could force 216 million people across six regions to move within their countries by 2050. How would the displacement of that many people affect the world as we understand it today? 216 million people on the move because of climate-impacted uh, events in their home communities. 
I think the thing the Groundswell report does well is present a number of scenarios, right? So the 216 million number is actually worst case scenario. So we're on um, a high emissions trajectory. We have high income inequality, unsustainable development. It's not very green, you know, um, it's not very resilient. It's not very equitable. Um, and so in that case, in that worst case scenario, that many people will be likely to move inside their borders because you know, climate changes have been ramped up and those impacts are being felt by that many people. Um, and I should say, like, again, that's only internal numbers of people, right? They don't even try to, to grapple with those crossing borders. Um, and what the, the scenario, though, does is show you that if we put into place policies now, you know, that people on the move one could decrease, but two, you'll be able to address sort of that movement in more holistic or um, positive ways, right? So we were talking about how do cities welcome uh, refugees or migrants? Um, in what ways can they make infrastructure more resilient for those refugees or migrants? How can they be integrated into, into that city life? Um, and so it's really hugely dependent on if we as a society actually come together and decide to... Um, you know, address these problems with proactive policy. And some of those policies are encouraging people to stay in their regions where they are rather than go from Africa to Europe or, you know, travel great distances, which kind of makes sense if you want to keep communities intact. Uh, but it's, there also could be sort of a connotation of kind of let's keep the people in the global south where they are, that the let's admit it, you know, rich white North kind of doesn't want to be overwhelmed by um, hordes of climate refugees. What are the power and geopolitical dynamics there? Yeah, I think uh, the U.S. and EU, for example, don't have a great track record of welcoming migrants or refugees. I mean, it, we've had our moments, certainly, but in, in most recent years, we, we're not doing a great job. Um, and I think often we talk about sort of climate-related refugees or, or migrations uh, migration in a way that um, makes it seem like a uh, worst case scenario there that thousands, hundreds of thousands of people will be coming to our borders and it will just be a crisis, right? The, the caravan narrative that we heard time and time again with the Trump administration, right? Um, I think all it really does is stoke sort of anti-immigrant sentiment, um, sees a rise in xenophobia and a hardening of borders rather than actually grapple with the issue, which is uh, we need to cut emissions and we need to be realistic that people may need to move because the climate is changing. Um, you referenced that um, those in the global north often point to the global south and say, you know, you can move freely <laughs> just in the global south, not to, not to our borders, right? Um, and I think, um, you know, pessimistically or cynically, we might say that's because that's a containment strategy. Right. Um, and we do have a history both in the US and in the EU of investing in development in order to contain. Right. Um, but it's also sort of just logical because people do actually mostly move across neighboring borders. Right. Um, there's there's huge trade ties there. There's usually, um, you know, a lot of uh, migration back and forth between those borders because of that trade. Um, and it is the easiest way without that sort of xenophobic um, tension <laughs> underlying it to, to really allow people to move freely across borders in the face of a disaster, which is what, what you want people to do to, to move freely to seek safety. Right. And on a re recent episode, we spoke with Wanjira Matai, who heads up Africa for the World Resources Institute. And in this sort of deglobalization era, she's supportive or speaks favorably of trying to increase regional trade ties in, in Africa to bolster regional economies and, and kind of keep dollars and people closer to home than rather than, you know, stretched out through this long global supply chain. Um, clearly, moving, uh, leaving home. Uh, is a painful and fraught decision for any family or individual. What is your observation of global migration taught you about how people navigate personal risk? Do I stay? Do I go? You know, fight or flight, stay and hunker down or go to someplace that might be better. 
Yeah, I think the decision to migrate is hugely complex and contextual. So uh, rarely, if ever, is climate change the only factor or only driver behind a migration decision, right? Usually exacerbates underlying tensions, right? So um, whether it be uh, social or economic or political, usually those things are more of the tipping point than than climate change, right? Um, However, I think that... um, you know, humans in general are, are not as rational as we like to think. So even these models and projections we're talking about, it's, it's based on a rational man, right? Um, and even just this afternoon, I was talking to somebody whose family um, actually had to flee Syria during the, or, you know, in, in the last few years during the civil war. And she said that she asked her aunt, when are you going to, when are you going to flee? And she said, well, your your cousin has a dentist appointment this week. So I think I don't think we can do it this week. And she was flabbergasted by that. Uh, and the point of that story is um, it's highly complex and complicated. Humans are really bad at assessing long-term risk. Um, so in the face of like a civil war, you should be better at making that <laughs> that um that uh that risk to move. However, with something like a slow onset event, it's really hard to assess sort of long-term risk. Um, the human brain is really, really bad at assessing long-term risk, in fact. Kaylee Ober, Senior Advocate and Program Manager with the Climate Displacement Program with Refugees International. Kaylee, thanks for sharing your insights on global migration and climate today. Thank you, Greg, for having me. On this Climate One, we've been talking about climate migration and displacement. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. To hear more, subscribe to our podcast on Apple or wherever you get your pods. Talking about climate can be awkward, difficult, sometimes political, and depressing, as you heard today. And it's critical to address the transitions we all need to make in all parts of society. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review if you're listening on Apple. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. By sharing, you can help your friends have their own deeper climate conversation. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our producers and audio editors are Ariana Brocious and Austin Colon. Megan Basilia is our production manager. Our team also includes consulting producer Sarah Catherine Coxon. Our theme music was composed by George Young. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Greg Dalton.